You are listening to Time Out with Coach B. I'm Steve Bittison, or as my basketball players often call me, Coach B. As a basketball coach, I might call a timeout for several different reasons. It might be to give instruction, correct a mistake, change the way we are playing, or simply to motivate us to play harder. Isn't that what God's Word does for us? 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that God's Word is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. That is exactly what this ministry and podcast is all about. I believe we all need to take a time out occasionally to receive instruction, correct mistakes, change the way we are going, or get motivated to play the game of life God's way. Over the course of this summer's messages, we have been looking into the book of Acts, studying the first church, that church that was the most effective church in the history of the world. Our goal has been to try to look past the way we have been doing church for centuries to find out what God wants us to do right now in the 21st century. Whereas in the book of Acts, thousands were joining the church every time they turned around, today, thousands upon thousands of people are dropping out of church, and countless others are only marginally attending. Why is that? What made that first church so different than the church today? Those are some of the answers we want to discover in this series that we've entitled Doing Church a New Way. But in reality, it won't be a new way at all. We are going to look back at how the first church did things. So take a time out away from your busy life and join me in this summer series today from the book of Acts. Today's message is titled, How to Be Truly Happy in your church. Let me start off today by asking a simple question. Are you truly happy in your church? Are you feeling fulfilled through your involvement in church? Yes, I did say that was a simple question, but how many of you, if you could reach out and touch me and look me in the eye, I can say that though the question might be simple, the answer is far more complex. Well, yes, coach, I'm happy with certain aspects of the church. I love the pastor. He's so easy to listen to, but the music, it's, it's too loud. Or we really love the music. It's inspiring and worshipful, but we are having a hard time really feeling connected to the other people in the church. Or maybe we love the church and the people in the church, but it's just too small and doesn't seem to have a vision to reach the world or, or even our community for Christ. Or perhaps the church is too large and and it has a big vision to reach the world and they're doing incredible things not only in our community but in the whole world but I personally cannot feel fulfilled there because I really can't use my gifts and interests to help build the kingdom. Everything is already such a well-oiled machine. So you see it really isn't a simple answer. In fact, I will go out on a limb and say that if you are happy with every single aspect of your church life then you probably are not truly involved in it. It serves your needs on a Sunday morning. So today I hope to start showing you how to truly be happy in your church, how to truly be fulfilled. No, you may not particularly like every aspect of your church, but that doesn't mean you cannot be happy and fulfilled in church. By the end of this series, I hope that you can truly get involved in your church, or if that's not possible, you find a church that you truly can be fulfilled in. Now, if you've been with us for our summer series where we've been looking through the book of Acts, focusing on what we can learn from that first church, which is still the most powerful and effective church in the history of Christianity, then you know we are hopefully learning how to make church today in the 21st century as effective as it was in the first century. Now, if you've been with us from the beginning of the series, you know that we have been saying that according to the model set by that first church, the church today is nothing like that church. Today's church is centered inside the four walls of a building on a Sunday morning, and almost everything that church does points back to those four walls. Small groups are established through what happens in those four walls, and even outreach ministries are formulated from within those four walls. But according to the model of that first church, that's backwards. The center of that church were the meetings that took place inside the homes and the living rooms and in the lives of the people as they went out into society. Now, we've talked about how fast that first church grew, growing from 120 to 3,000 in one day, and that every day after that, people were being added. At last count, we had over 5,000 in the church, and it was still growing, despite the persecution that the established religion of the day was putting on them. 
as you know, the bigger a group or organization is, or even a church gets, the more logistics it takes to operate smoothly. This first church was no exception. They had far outgrown what the apostles could handle. Even though the day-to-day -day ministry of the people in the church took place in other people's houses, it was still having to do with the apostles. There were simply too many people for 12 apostles to organize everything. Let's face it, with over 5,000 people, and let's say the average small group that met in someone's houses was about a dozen people. That would be over 400 houses that people were meeting in for churches. I know much of what, of what people needed could be taken care of within that smaller body. There were times that they needed to have some kind of organization over those small groups as a whole. Well, several weeks ago, we talked about how the 12 apostles were the main ones responsible for the teaching of the ways of Jesus. The New Testament had not been written yet, and they were the ones who had walked with Jesus every day for three years, and a few had even been writing their memoirs in what would later become the first four books of the New Testament. So quite likely, these 12 were leading a few small groups themselves, and the people that sat under those teachings would probably take what they had learned back to their homes where they met with other believers, and shared what they had learned there. Remember, they didn't have a large building that, had, that would hold several thousand people in it. So with all of that as a backdrop, let's look at Acts 6. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of the believers and they said, We apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so brothers, select seven men who, will, who are well respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Verse 5 says, Everyone liked this idea and they chose the following people and they list several here. Verse 6 these seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Ah, so here we see it. The first sign of real discontent in the church. Some people were being taken care of and others were not. In fact, I think some of the small groups had taken the responsibility to make sure that their widows were being taken care of, while other small groups may not have had the resources to do that. How many of you know that even in our modern churches today that try to work under these first church principles, that all small groups are not created equal? Some do a better job at some things than others do. And that could be for a variety of reasons. It might be that they don't have the resources or perhaps they don't have the training. They simply don't understand their responsibilities as a small group. Or it could be that they misunderstand those purposes. That often happens. And sadly, it could also be that some small groups know what to do, and they know why they're there, but they simply don't have the desire or the fortitude to carry through with their responsibilities. And that is probably because they are living under the four walls of a Sunday morning mentality of what church is supposed to be. They view themselves as an extension of those four walls not the soul of those four walls. So if they fail to be the church, then no big deal, right? They're just a ministry of the church to come alongside the church and maybe help out, on a minist help out in ministry from time to time when it's convenient. After all, the true ministry of the church is what happens inside the four walls of the building on a Sunday morning. Well, this first church was having one of those problems, and so a group of them took the problem to the apostles, the church leaders. Those men who were ultimately responsible for the spiritual welfare and teaching that went on inside all of those groups. Now remember, we said that there might have been as many as 400 or perhaps more groups meeting in each other's homes, meaning if things were divided evenly, those 12 apostles were in some fashion responsible for over 30 different small groups. Well, they wisely decided they, they simply could not take on the responsibility of taking care of the people who were in need. You know, I guess that is even a difference in what many expect from churches today. In so many churches, the people expect the pastor or the pastors to be the ones to take care of those in need. 
If I'm sick or in the hospital, I expect one of the pastors to come visit me. But these 12 apostles tell us right here in Acts chapter 6 that they simply cannot do all those things. Nor should they. Because we see in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 that the gifts of Christ came to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. They were given to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. Those leaders in the church are there to lead others and equip others to do works of ministry. Not to do all the work themselves. So these 12 apostles told the people to choose seven men from within the church. Seven, the number of completeness. Because when God sets something in motion, like the church, he does it in a perfect and complete way. And notice this, the apostles did not choose who those seven men were going to be. They told the body, the representatives from all the small groups, to choose seven men who are well respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. Well respected. That means choose someone that no one is going to look at and ask why you chose that person. Choose someone who everyone knows is not going to have a personal agenda. Choose someone who has, ha who has a good reputation and does not carry with him baggage that would cause people to disrespect him. And they must be full of the Spirit. Well, if you've been part of this ministry and my teachings and have listened to this past, po past podcast, you have heard me say a few times that being filled with the Spirit is not some high and mighty hocus pocus thing that causes people to stand in awe of you. It is not something that is always accompanied by signs and wonders, though sometimes it is. And you know that it's really sad that in some cases Christians are looked down upon and perhaps even viewed as second class Christians because they do not speak in tongues or demonstrate signs and wonders. Some believe that if these things are not visible in a person, then they simply are not filled with the Holy Spirit. They may be Christians, they say, but they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. That, Christians, is a wrong and terrible view to have. As I have said a few different times, being filled with the Spirit is when you constantly walk in and live by and demonstrate the nine parts of the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So they were to choose men who were constantly demonstrating those nine things. And they needed to have wisdom. Don't choose as your leader someone who cannot differentiate right from wrong or good from bad. Don't choose people who often make wrong decisions. Choose someone who is able to make decisions based on seeing things from God's perspective. So go out and choose people to head up these ministries using those three things as your criteria. Better yet, be one of those people that others will want to choose. You see that everyone who is part of the church, whether it is in the large corporation churches or the small group home churches, has something that they can bring to the table. Something that makes them an integral part of that group. Something God has gifted them in for the sole reason of building up the body of Christ. Some are there for encouraging others. Others are there to empathize with others who are hurting. Some are there to lead people to the kingdom and others are there to offer their home as a place to meet so that others can become part of that community. Some love to bless others in their group with things or bringing food while others are able to continually keep the group's focus on God and what his word says. At the risk of repeating myself too many times, and I probably have, I believe that the best avenue for everyone to be able to use those things that God has gifted them in with, and, in, and blessing others is in the church that meets in small groups in homes. Once again, if the center of church life is within the four walls on a Sunday morning service, most people will not be using what God has gifted them with or give them, them a special heart for. And that is the beauty of the church's center being in small groups. Not only does everyone have the opportunity to use their gifts, the group functions best when everyone does what God has gifted them to do. In fact, I would go as far as to say that the small groups need each other much more than the four walls on a Sunday morning do. So whether you are part of a small group 
or your church life is pretty much centered inside the four walls on a Sunday morning, or for many of you who have dropped out of church, and not because you want to stray away from God, but that you are tired of the politics and the religious traditions of the church, let me ask you to consider how you can help advance the kingdom of God. I'm not asking you to prove a point as to what kind of church is best or even to lay a guilt trip on you. I do believe that there are many of you who want to help advance and deepen the kingdom of God. You have gifts, abilities, and interests and desires to do so. But in your present circumstances, you simply don't know how. So that is why I asked the question, how can you help? Think about your current church or small group. Do you have an interest in music? See where you can help. Do you enjoy teaching the Bible and making it practical and come alive in people's hearts? How can you share those things that God is teaching you? Maybe you are more the behind the scenes type person. You want to offer your home to meet in, but you want someone else to lead the group. Great, offer your home. Maybe you are one who has a strong desire to pray for others. Be that prayer warrior for your group. Maybe you like to help people in need. It might be helping them financially or it might be helping them in physical ways. However it is, you like to help. Do it. The bottom line is that you need to be using your gifts. That is the only way that you will ever be fulfilled spiritually. But perhaps more importantly, that is the only way that the church, especially when it is centered in a small group, can truly have an impact on people. For any church to have an impact on the world, both in impacting the lives of the people within their church as well as impacting the world around them, it must work together in unity. The beauty of having a variety of people all involved, not just a few minority of, of them involved, is that each person brings something unique to the table. And when we are operating in that uniqueness, then our gifts begin to stand out and people's needs are met. The early church called seven men to head up a new ministry, not because they had money or prestige or power. They called them because they were respected, were living under the control of the Holy Spirit, and they knew how to make wise decisions. In other words, they were living the Christian life the way it is supposed to be lived. The people recognized this in these men and knew that they were the best ones to head up this new ministry. So what about you? What are you going to do? How are you going to live? Are you one who is a follower of Christ, one of his disciples? Or are you just the average Christian who doesn't really do anything to impact the world? If you are his disciples, then you know you cannot just exist the way many or even most of the Christian world exist. You know you cannot just go with the status quo and live like other Christians. And listen carefully, the way you view church cannot stay following the, the model of the four walls on a Sunday morning. You know you have to be the church, not just go to church. You know you have to read the Bible and you have to do what it says. That's all I'm asking you to do. Read the Bible, ask God what he wants to show you while you read it, and then live accordingly to what you see. You do what it says. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. I pray that you are being blessed by this ministry. If you have a question or comment, please feel free to email me at coachbittison at aol.com or visit our website at www.timeoutwithcoachb.wordpress.com. Join us next week for the seventh week in our summer series, Doing Church a New Way. We will look at Acts chapter 7 and ask the question, what happens when the church fails its mission. You won't want to miss it. Until then, may God surround you with his love, fill you with his grace, and capture your heart.